Hello, everybody. I'm, I'm doing this again, repeating. Uh, my name is Graciela Cabello. I am the Director of Youth and Community Engagement for Los Padres Forest Watch. We are an organization, advocacy organization, based on the cent California Central Coast, um, specifically Santa Barbara. I am joining today from uh, uh, ancestral Chumash land. Uh, and I'm here with the amazing Rue Map, who is the founder and CEO of Outdoor Afro. Um, we're going to be talking about some exciting things that she's doing, mostly her book. Um, but you also get an insight into Outdoor Afro and how that's all connected. Um, and so just to give you a little bit more information about Rue, um, she founded Outdoor Afro as a social enterprise in 2009. It's headquartered in Oakland, California. Outdoor Afro Incorporated as of 501C in 2015, and it's now in its 14th year, leading this um, 14th year, and it's a leading organization where Black people and nature meet, includes an annual participation network of more than 60,000 people. Pretty amazing. Um, and Outdoor Afro selects and trains more than 100 volunteer leaders who guide their local communities in nature activities across the United States leading up to 32 local networks in 60 cities. These leaders help reconnect Black people and Black communities with the outdoors through outdoor recreation, education, and conservation. So welcome, Rue. Is there anything that you want to add to that in terms of how you identify or about oh, that work? Thank you. Well, first of all, thank you so much for having me. And it's just a joy to be reconnected with you. I think we met Gosh, I want to say like maybe eight years ago, um, working with uh, Latino Outdoors and with Jose Gonzalez. And um, it's also been great to see how you've continued to evolve and grow your work and and just how this conversation in general um, has just evolved to include more people. And um, and so it's just a, a, a lovely reunion moment um, that I get to have with you. And I'm really excited to be able to share this new literal chapter of the work um, that I get to express through Outdoor Afro. Thank you. Yeah, I know it's super exciting watching you. I've seen everything, that, even in the last year, it seems like you've had a lot going on with the clothing line at REI. And then the book came out. Um, we started carrying the book in, in our store, the Forest Watch store, um, sometime in the fall. And I thought it was just such a great idea. It's like, you know, a collection of stories um, from folks all across the country that I thought was super needed. Um, and I personally just really enjoyed reading it. Um, it's just full of like so much vibrant information and um, stories. So yeah, I thought it was great. It would be great to, to invite you and to talk a little bit more about that. Hopefully get other folks excited about it. Um, and motivate folks to want to read it themselves. You know, I think it's a book that everybody could really benefit from um, in so many different ways. You know, like mm -hmm. I related to it um, from like a family perspective, a community perspective, um, connection to the land and food. Um, and then mm -hmm. the historical information in there, which like some of it I had never really heard of or known of, like um, I learned about Martha's Vineyard, <laughs> which was, you know, all this stuff, but I thought it was really, really fascinating. Um, so yeah, I would love for all of that to get out there and more people to to read it, to connect to it. And um, so I'm, I'm glad you're here. We're going to start off with um, Rue doing a reading of the introduction, and then we'll go into more detailed questions as they relate to her book and to the work that she's doing. Um, so if you want to go ahead and start, Rue. Um, sure. Yeah. sure. Thank you so much for that lovely tee up. And uh, it's really my pleasure to read the introduction of Nature Swagger. Um, if you don't know what it looks like, this is the, well, you know, we've got our background here, but this is the cover. And um, it is absolutely in dialogue with the work of Outdoor Afro. And I'm going to read to you all the introduction that really helps set the table for the book. But also for those of you who aren't quite familiar with Outdoor Afro or like, why do I do this work in the first place? It helps to explain a lot of that as well. Um, so I'm going to put on my number two readers, y'all. You know, I'm definitely at that age where I need a little 
assist. Um, <laughs> and I, I think about like how small the type is uh, that we select for the book. Um, so there may be many more of you just like me. <laughs> um, anyway, um, without further ado, let's get started with a standing invitation. Our family's ranch in Lake County, California stood on 14 acres of land covered in English walnut trees and sprawling oak trees that shaded our modest home. The entrance to our driveway was flanked by a rock masonry frame and from it was a homemade black and white sign with letters carved out by a wood router, big oak. It was a remarkable corner lot with open ranch fencing on two sides that allowed anyone driving by to easily take in what was going on in the yard. People routinely slowed as they rounded the corner to see what lively events were happening at Big Oak. The land was lovingly and purposely tended to by my father, A.C. Levias, who delighted in creating both its form and function to enhance the experience for our bi-weekly family runs and for everyone who frequently visited our ranch. There was a barn and a shop built with symbiotic purposes in mind. These would be where we built the pen that housed our pigs and other livestock. Beyond that lay a bountiful vegetable garden, vines full of grapes and trees heavy with fruit in the summer. My father also built a walk-in smokehouse, a swimming pool, a swing set, and eventually a tennis court. Altogether, our ranch was a place that holistically embodied outdoorsman grit with a nod to community entertainment and a resort style twang. My dad was a black man from the Jim Crow South with an eighth grade education who had the audacity to create a place like this in a nearly all white town. But he was respected in the community. And on one occasion, the county newspaper covered one of our large family events on its front page. As a child, I was always thrilled to visit the ranch. I delighted in taking part in hunting, fishing, and exploring the surrounding woodlands around country roads by bike or on foot. Nearby Copsey Creek was an oasis of discovery and learning about aquatic ecosystems, as well as the seasonal flow of water. I recall many times getting out of the car and wondering if those tadpoles or pollywogs I saw a couple of weeks before had turned into frogs. How high was the river after a big rain? At the ranch, I fell deeply in love with nature. More than just bountiful and beautiful land, the ranch was also a site for celebration where we invited family, friends, and members of the community to enjoy holidays, parties, and reunions. I especially loved when we kids put together talent shows for the adults who would spend the day talking, laughing, and playing games like bid whist and dominoes. I received lessons in hospitality at the ranch my dad had a famous saying, you have a standing invitation, meaning once you have visited our home, you are always welcome back. Sometimes there'd be so many people dropping by or staying over, it felt like the house might explode, but there was always room for everyone, even if it meant people slept on the kitchen floor with a homemade quilt or under a makeshift sheet tent outside. And there was always something cooking or ready on the stove, on the grill, or right out of the oven. One more barbecued rib, a bowl of collard greens, a slice of 7-Up cake, a cup of punch, nothing lacking. The hospitality my parents showed everyone is still unsurpassed and still raved about to this very day. Those welcoming ways of the ranch meant that adults and children alike could experience wonder under the bright stars at night, unseen back home in a light polluted cityscape. Air so fresh and fragrant of lake and oak woodlands, the euphoric sound and experience of silence. I had a front row seat to the joy of community in that nature which brought about a yearning in me to create and be a part of something like it for the rest of my life. Back home in Oakland, 
I participated in the Girl Scouts, which reminded me of the intimacy and affinity of community on my family ranch. I love the Girl Scout mottos, our songs, and our rituals, but the highlight was learning how to camp. Mind you, my family had been an outdoor loving family, but no one saw the need or had the wherewithal to camp. That might've been regarded as something other people do. After my first experience with the Girl Scout troop, I was hooked on camping and everything it encompassed. Even chores were more fun, tackled as a group in nature while singing songs. It was at this same time that I started a diary, a prized Hello Kitty red padded book with empty lines of possibility. In painstaking detail through my new curly cursive, I wrote what I saw and what I did and shared the stories of how we related to one another in our pop-up community. Around this time, I became fascinated by technology. Growing up in the Bay Area meant being exposed to the cutting edge of early computer technology. Carl B. Monk, my Oakland Public Elementary School, had Commodore PET computers for our classroom. By the age of 10, I was programming basic language so easily that my parents purchased a home version of the Commodore for me to use so I could continue practice this new skill and passion. I would sometimes bring my computer to the ranch and practice programming in quieter moments. Eventually, I found my passion for activism and community service in college through both the Black Student Union and Women's Center, where I would make lifelong friends. By the early 90s, I had a capstone experience mountaineering with Outward Bound and summited peaks in the high Sierra as the only black woman in our group. That trip summed up an acute awareness in me to understand nature as a powerful teacher while also highlighting the isolation I felt as a young black woman still trying to navigate young adulthood in a new remote wilderness setting with people who shared cultural experiences different than my own. Out of my experience using digital technology over the years, it was easy to become an early adopter of the internet. And with the renewed focus on the outdoors as a young adult, I sought out other outdoor enthusiast discussion groups in the World Wide Web's Newsnet groups. And, but my in-person group experiences that came out of those discussions were not satisfying. I did not feel welcomed or understood for my abilities. Group organizers did not always explain what I needed to know to have a successful, fun, and safer experience. And far too often, I did not experience groups of people with more folks who look like me. With a lifetime of understanding nature and community under my feet, I knew how I benefited greatly from it all along. As I became a wife and mother, nature was a solid place to nurture my family and an affordable way to experience vacation, visiting beaches and trails discovered in travel books, often close to home. We became regulars at our city's affordable family camp where it was easy to make friends as we spent hours under the trees talking, watching talent show performances and indulging in all the eating we could at its chow palace. But still in having these experiences, especially farthest away from Oakland, I saw a few black people and felt like my community was missing out on all that I knew nature had given me. In my early thirties, my life changed dramatically. I was no longer married and was raising three children on my own. I decided to return to college to tend to a long neglected undergraduate degree understanding the need to have more options to earn a living and support my family. After two years of sleepless nights of study at a junior college while working full time with determination, I found relief in an admission letter to UC Berkeley. For the next three years, me and my kids went to college, though only one of us was sitting in its classrooms. But toward the end of my degree completion, <clears throat> I was looking over the edge into a country in recession. The goal of getting that great job did not seem certain anymore. So I considered business school and found support from a mentor to explore that option. But that too was gonna be a challenge. 
how could I consider going away from my community to study intensely with my three growing children who needed me more than ever? I'll never forget the moment in a conversation with that mentor, Frida K. Porcline, who understood my dilemma and asked, if time and money were not an issue, what would you be do? What would you do? I opened my mouth and my life fell out. I'd probably start a website to reconnect black people to the outdoors. It was a moment of revelation, a key that fit perfectly into the lock of this magic moment, opening the door to possibilities that are still unfolding. It was as if the truths of my life were hiding in plain sight and now wanted to be seen and understood. Community, nature, technology, and writing could finally be woven into a single expression. It was a moment of a true homecoming for me to be fully expressed and healed as an individual while helping my community do the same. Soon after that talk with Frida, I pulled out my laptop and created a new blog, which I quickly yet thoughtfully named Outdoor Afro using a borrowed template and a photo of me on a mountain in California's Sierra on that transformative outward bound trip. My first blog post was titled, how did an Oakland girl like me come to love getting her camp on anyway? And I told the story of growing up in a family that loved both nature and community, describing how it was possible for an Oakland girl to come to love nature and how those experiences helped me to learn, grow, and appreciate myself and others. The comments were overwhelmingly supportive. I'm so glad I found you. I love to camp with you sometime, or I feel like you made this blog just for me. It was not long before I received encouraging reactions from people from all over the United States who reflected back to me their own joy and love in nature. Something was resonating. I had recently studied art history at UC Berkeley and understood the discipline and power of representation to tell stories, along with the importance of using current technologies to share that representation at scale. I reflected on my studies about Sojourner Truths, Karsh de Visites, or calling cards that leveraged the new technology of photography during the Civil War to create greater visibility for the movement that successfully abolished slavery and ended that war. Now before me in 2009 was a new frontier of social media that democratized and forever changed how public relations and marketing could work. From my kitchen table, I decided to tell a new story using images unlike anything I had seen growing up among the glossy magazines of black people as in nature, as strong, beautiful, and free. Just like what I always knew and experienced growing up. Over the following years, I gave myself over to my work with increasing focus and determination. I took a part-time job at my local Audubon where I learned about environmental conservation and later at a foundation that helped me to understand how outdoor Afro might fit into a field of work. I leveraged my years of personal and professional networking and experience in business, the arts and community building to level up that blog to become a national and staffed organization that today broadens the definition of not only what outdoor participation looks like, but also who leads these experiences. In the past 12 years, since I sat down and wrote that first blog post, Outdoor Afro has grown into an organization that touches thousands through in-person adventure and millions more through digital media to broaden what outdoor participation looks like and who leads experiences in nature all over the country you'll find outdoor Afro leaders getting people out to camp in the Colorado Rockies, hike in view of the St. Louis Gateway Arch, bird watch in the Florida Everglades, canoe in the Mississippi River, and more, all while learning about the long heritage of Black people connecting in nature. Some of our trained leaders have even gone on to do capstone events together such as climb the Sierra Heights of Mount Whitney in California, 
walk in Harriet Tubman's footsteps along the Appalachian Trail and pilgrimage to the far reaches of Africa and Tanzania to find new definitions of summit on Mount Kilimanjaro, surrounded by people who look like them. This journey has taken me to many different places and introduced me to many incredible people who have become my newest wave of lifelong friends, all of which has taught me profound lessons about the personal and societal challenges that nature is adept at helping us solve. In the years of racial divide and civic unrest in which my work developed, we began Healing Heights as a showcase of continued and expanded clarity of the power of nature to teach, transform, and heal. We can also lift up and expand on beloved historical figures such as Harriet Tubman as a true wilderness leader. She absolutely journeyed our people to freedom through nature. Most importantly, it's become clear to me over the years that nature is not someplace over there. It is present within us, always. Therefore, the concept of connecting people to nature is actually a journey inward and a homecoming with oneself. As I joyously learned about nature and myself over the years, I eventually felt the quickening of a book that wanted to be born so I could share the gift of our empowered story with others. I felt transported to the innocent yet powerful moment when I wrote in a journal for the first time as a child and understood there was so much more I needed to write about and share today. Not only of my own journey to become joyously transformed through nature, but also the stories of others who might never have had the specific and loving platform of this book. A diary all grown up. While enthusiastically focused on Black American experiences, nature's swagger is a universal roadmap to dis discover the delights, joys, and possibilities of transformation for anyone through nature. You will discover the epiphanies of high adventure alongside meditations on love of a favorite place or person and poetic revelations about our wild food ways, how we can all work together and by extension, how we can too. This book, as my father would describe it, is your standing invitation to reconnect with nature and write your own story and transform within it. Thank you. Thank you for that. That was so beautiful and um, it's really good to hear you read it in your own voice. And, you know, it's, um, I think it's so awesome to, to hear your story and how it all began. Um, so the way that the book is organized, um, I thought was really interesting in the different sections um, to kind of, and I, I, I mean, there's overlapping themes, I think, in, in all of the, the stories, um, but the, some of them were homecoming, places of purpose, uh, hands on the land, and in the name of joy. Uh, so I kind of wanted to talk a little bit more about that. Um, in the homecoming section of the book, you talk about how for many Black Americans, the words homecoming and reunion are interchangeable and that they can exist one inside the other. Can you talk about the impact that those words have had on your relationship with nature and the impact it's had in building outdoor Afro? I think you, you, you touched on it in your introduction, um, but for those who you know haven't read all the stories and all the interweaving, can you talk about the impact that it's, you see it's happening more broadly? Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, I'm definitely leaning into the <clears throat> Black American tradition um, that actually have some really important roots um, during the emancipation phase um, post uh, our, our period of enslavement in this country as a platform for finding your kin. Mm -hmm. um, so homecomings and family reunions um, have been a part of uh the theme of family gatherings, um, and certainly other cultures do family reunions, um, but the, the way that it's remained this touchstone of keeping family and the values of, of staying connected to family together over the years has really been important. And the thing that I 
recognized is that a lot of these family reunion opportunities are often held in nature. Um, and so it, it hadn't, it wasn't lost on me that nature is an important and, you know, um, just beautiful way to ground us to not only each other, but also to places. So when, for instance, in my family, there's a family reunion, it's often in Texas, um, where a lot of our family origins are, and there are site visits to areas of importance. It might be to a, a special church or a graveyard or other outdoor gathering place. And one thing that has felt true in the work of Outdoor Afro is that when we bring people together who are folks who may not even know each other into these nature places, um, that family reunion, that feeling connected as kin is, um, is something that has been a consistent part of what helps this work come alive for people and also attracts them to continue to connect in over and over. And as you know, you know, we have a lot of folks who relocate to different parts of the country. Um, they may be far away from their blood family. And so nature is this beautiful platform for people to find their kin around common interests uh, in, in outdoor experiences. Um, and so, you know, and as I mentioned before, you know, homecoming is not necessarily about connecting with other people, but it's about finding that connection with yourself. And I have so many ex examples and experiences in nature where I got closer to being clear about who I am um, and, and my relationship with the na natural world um, that, you know, has, again, that same motivation and outcome of that that family reunion and that connection among kin. Mm -hmm. So are you finding that people within the outdoor Afro community are, are um, maybe inadvertently uh, meeting like relatives who are like maybe a couple degrees of separation? And um, is there any fun yeah. stories about that? Oh yeah, I mean, you know, as you know, like when you get people outside, you know, we're not all talking about the flora, the fauna, the birds. We're talking about, you know, current events. You're talking about where to get your hair done. Um, <laughs> who's selling the best, you know, plates of food. Um, and people are not only finding common ground, but they're also taking the lessons that we share with Outdoor Afro back into their own homes. And that's something that we've been really, really deliberate about highlighting to not make outdoor Afro be at cause for how people get out. Like I'm, I love it when people get out with outdoor Afro, but it's more meaningful to me to see people learn whatever they need to learn. Maybe they need to learn like where to get to a place, where to park, um, you know, how long a hike is going to be. And then when I see people on social media go back to those places we've introduced them to with their own families, yeah. like me, like that is success. And, and for people to use the outdoors just as part of their toolkit for how they connect with each other, how they find, you know, rest, recreation, you know, it's, it's, it's so wonderful, uh, the ways that we're able to really kind of keep that theme going way beyond the scope of what our organization is tasked to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that. I love that um, it's weaving in like access and community and all these different ways, because I think, you know, in the working in the conservation community, um, often we kind of get stuck in like, what's the trajectory to get there or to be in the space, right? And so it, it, what does that look like traditionally or in mainstream conservation, like, oh, you go and you get an environmental studies degree and that's yeah. sort of how like, you get into the space, right? But I love like really sharing like how broad and all the opportunities for for people to get involved and like have established that um, unique connection so that we can all build this like greater conservation movement in whatever way that that means to people. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, my dad was a conservationist, but you're not going to find him in a book, you know, like he... Mm -hmm you know, he was living in a harmonious practice 
um, with the natural world and was conservation and reuse minded in mm -hmm. everything he did. And there's a lot of that history in our yeah. families, in our communities. And that is exactly what I hope to achieve through our work is to redefine like what conservation looks like and how it can, you know, really be so much about what is already with you, already in your family, already a part of your history. And it's an asset-based conversation, right? It's not about, you know, looking at conservation as like one thing at the top of this hierarchy that everybody's got to ascribe to or, you know, use as the benchmark and how it looks from family to family, region to region, um, you know, can, can change. And over time it, it evolves, but it is for me, um, been a very personal journey, um, and, and a celebratory one that aims to include more people, mm -hmm. you know, versus, um, you know, be a litmus test for entry. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's funny is reading about your dad. Um, I, I wanted to learn more about your dad. It's almost like you can um, write a whole book on, on your dad. I like went and tried to Google like the area to see if there was any information because he sounds like such a fascinating person, you know? And yeah. Like, yeah. I mean, about. he definitely, he definitely um, had a lot of favor, like people in our family respected him um, for all that he accomplished uh, just, you know, through what, in our family, we call mother wit that, I mean, my parents were always like, you can be book smart, but if you don't have mother wit, which is basically common sense, yeah. <laughs> um, you're not going to get very far in life. So, um, there was just so much wisdom, um, that he and my mom had that, um, that I just, I keep alive in every way that I can through my work, but also just how I live my life. And, and, and how I show up for other people. Um, they're no longer living, you know, so there's a huge part of my work of outdoor Afro. And of course, by extension, the book that is um, a way to give, pay homage um, and to keep alive those great values that, that they gave me that, you know, I can hopefully share with others so that they can pass on uh, in their communities. Yeah. Well, I think dad would be proud <laughs> and your mom, mom and dad would be proud. Thank you. Um, okay, so the, the book is filled with references to places of purpose and welcoming nature spaces for Black people and how they represent um, and how Black people have persisted through blatant exclusion at, and from public recreation and codified Jim Crow laws. Mm -hmm. um, what would you say to folks who don't have access to iconic Black havens in the outdoors and how they can create their own places of purpose? Yeah, I mean, I think we, again, back to what I was saying about an asset-based lens, you know, we have to recognize that, first of all, nature's everywhere. Like, it's everywhere. And yeah, not all of us can get in a car and drive, you know, four or five hours to an iconic public land. Um, but there's so much that's happening right in our own neighborhoods, right outside of our kitchen windows. And this is what Nature Swagger has really set out to do is to help us really see that there's there's nature all around um, that anybody can connect with if we just shift our focus for you know what is um, really like within arm's reach. Mm -hmm. And then you know, of course we have outdoor Afro, we have you know our um, many different parks and public agencies that run programming. If you're not quite sure how to approach a place, there's so many points of entry that exist today that didn't even exist like you know 14, 15 years ago. So there's really no like excuse. <laughs> <laughs> if you can tell me you don't have access to nature. I will look at you side eye and I'll be like, <laughs> all right, let's break that down. Oh, you know, like even like I was, I'll give an example. Like the other day I was um, uh, meeting some folks and this guy, you know, immediately tells me knowing what I do for a living. He's like, I don't do the outdoors. I don't do none of that stuff. And I was like, uh-huh, really? I said, well, do you like cookouts? <laughs> and he was like, yeah. I was like, that counts. Okay. <laughs> 
like, yeah. like if you would like to go to a park and fire up a grill, yeah, is being outdoors. That's day camp, essentially what you're doing. Yeah. <laughs> and I feel like, you know, we have to um, maybe, and this is where, you know, sometimes in our outreach efforts, we get a little too technical and wonky about it. And we need to just kind of bring it down to earth and help people see like what you're already doing um, is absolutely engaging with the outdoors in a meaningful way. And then I also think we should think about how we even rebrand certain experiences to just open up the aperture for more people to count themselves in. One way that that looks to me is, you know, maybe I decide to say, hey, we're going to have like a get together uh, potluck at Lake Merritt in Oakland, right? Um, and I bring like spotting scopes and I bring, you know, bird education materials because it's the oldest wildlife sanctuary in mm. the country. Mm. But if I were to like call it, hey, let's go birding together. And <laughs> people <laughs> be like, mm -hmm. that, I, that's not me. I don't know anything about that. It's true. So, um, and so we have to like, you know, meet people literally where they are, because if you say, yeah, you know, Graciela, let's get together and like do a kickback at the lake. You'd be like, yeah, I'm down. And if I bring those, you know, materials in the spotting scope and we look at birds and, you know, you know, make, you know, light, but, you know, be focused about what we're, where we are, what we're looking at, the outcomes are the same. So um, that's been a huge uh, value in Outdoor Afro is to, you know, call things, you know, really what they are mm -hmm. and, and, and refer to them in, in ways that people can understand what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you weave in environmental conservation ethic into what you do, um, you'll have the same outcomes and yeah. you'll get people more excited to join you. Yeah, I agree with that. And we've definitely had some of that here where I invited people to go hiking and they were like, hiking oh, that's work you, you hiking want me to go you want me to go hiking and then I'm like we're gonna do an event called tacos and trails and then I have a whole list of people. I'm telling you listen every <laughs> like everybody I know like who's not necessarily like in our world um they think about the outdoors as like labor yeah sure. like yeah. why would you sign up for that if you like you're a busy working family you know and you have probably a lot of pressing um, obligations and responsibilities on the very little free time you have. You might even work on the weekends, right? Mm -hmm. Like there's all kinds of, you might be in the gig economy, right? So like we have to rethink how people actually have time to get outside and mm -hmm. what does leisure look like to them right. and, and really meeting people, you know, in their values versus trying to, you know, kind of make people conform to this, you know, these very narrow definitions of what outdoor engagement can look like. Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes that even means like doing things around when they're available because it does, you know, some families work like six, seven days a week. So, totally. Um, and then when you've got time off, you got, oh, we've got soccer practice. We got to look, check on grandma. We've got to go to yeah, church. We got to do all the money dues. I mean, so, you know, that's why when people come to me with these statistics about what, what, Black people are not doing in the outdoors. I'm like, let's talk about how busy working families live. Yeah. And, and then we can talk about what they may choose in their very finite and, and highly prized leisure time. Mm -hmm. uh, and oftentimes people are, if you look at where people actually live, they're actually getting out where they live. They don't have the time to go and drive, you know, out of state to mm -hmm. go to a national you know, refuge or park or whatever, but they're, they're very heavily engaged with their local parks, playgrounds and other places. And that counts. Yes, absolutely. I agree. Um, I have another question for you. Well, I have like, several more, but I'll, I'll only use one for me and then I'll move on forward to the Q and A. Um, if we could use nature and joy as a way to heal our communities on a larger scale and there were no limitations present, what would that look like for you? And what would we need to build to create or to build or create to get us there? And and I think the question is coming from a place of, you know, we, we're still having conversations about access 
and how so many folks are struggling and they're they're not living healthy lives because some people um i would say i've read statistics that say like the majority of um people of color don't have access to a park within a one mile walking distance right um and so what does that look like on a larger scale if we didn't have any limitations like do you, would, do you have any visions of that or that you would want to yeah. share yeah, I mean that. I mean, there's a lot to unpack in that question. Um, just because I've been also tracking uh, green gentrification. So, like, you know, sometimes those yeah. parks thrive in communities, and then the value of homes, the yeah, people get pushed out. And, yeah. So, I think we have to um, kind of look at access. This gets back to my earlier um, answer about what does access to nature qualify as and broadening the definition and helping people feel good about what they do have, right? Because again, we get into these hierarchies, right? Like what's a real, what's real nature? What's real engagement with nature? And I think we got to stop that. We have as so much of this starts with our own thinking and perspective. And if we frame up a question that really highlights a deficit situation, you know, like, okay, so I'm not within 10 minutes of a park, right? But it doesn't mean that I have zero access. There may be other points of access that are not necessarily public lands, right? There may be the opportunity that I have to do a container garden on my apartment balcony there may be opportunities when I'm walking my dog to, um, you know, do a bird survey uh, that is absolutely necessary from a citizen science perspective and a real meaningful way to contribute to conservation. So like, let's, let's start with like reframing mm. what it means to get out in nature, point out the ways that people already are getting out to nature and then really helping us to embrace the benefits of it. Um, because when we do rest our attention on opportunities to be in nature, whether it's just sometimes for me, it's about like right now, we are in the San Francisco Bay Area in the most snugly rainy day possible. And I'm just getting so much of watching the rainfall um, from the window beyond this monitor. Um, and so like we've we've got to, expand this viewpoint of nature engagement. And then the other piece is to your question about like, what does it look like? I feel like the more we focus in on what we do have versus what we don't have, I think it will leave less people feeling bereft yes. and will help us live lives that are more connected to something bigger beyond ourselves you know, even if it's just that branch of a leaf that you've been staring at that has a blossom that emerges on the scene this time of the year, like that, that small but really significant connection takes you away uh, from all of the other noise in society mm -hmm. and connects you to the wonder that I feel we all need, no matter what our ages are. Um, and, and I also want to emphasize that connections to nature should be multi-generational, should be a part of what we talk about at the dinner table. They're the stories of our families that we should keep alive. We should all be learning how to swim. Um, so there's just a lot of integration that's available to us that I believe will have an outcome of people living happier and healthier and more connected lives to each other, but also to our wild all around. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that. Um, I think about, you know, uh, for me, how uh, one of the big connection points was with food, right? And just like um, going to the, when I started going to the farmer's market and talking to, you know, the farmers there and just feeling like a lot more connected to the food and land, it was, it was a big game changer for me. And, you know, you think like, oh, that's actually a really good way to feel like I am connected in some way or another. 
And you're contributing too. Yeah. Like you like you're not just a consumer. You're like contributing to seasonality and and the ability for these farmers to, mm-hmm. you know, help us, you know, eat better. And you probably treat that food differently in your house than mm-hmm. you get from, you know, just some random place. You know, mm-hmm. you're you're going to research recipes. You're going to, you know, want to, you know, really honor that food and its source because of your awareness of that connection. And see, this is what nature swagger is all about, like in a nutshell. Yeah. It is about <laughs> it is about this l- fully integrated and lived experience empowered by nature knowledge. Mm-hmm. Right. That it's not, again, it's not like nature over there, but it's it's an embodiment. It and it flows out through the decisions you make about how you live your life and and how you ultimately can live in harmony um, with with this planet and its various you know biomes and seasons. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. That's what the great thing is. Um, okay, so we have a couple um, question um, questions here. So one is, can you share any thoughts about the current? pros and cons of modern technology, social media in particular, in terms of broadening exposure to images, concepts of nature, versus also now competing for attention spans, and in some cases, immobilizing today's youth in ways that limit exposure to outdoor experiences. Or maybe in other words, are you worried about the impacts of social media on today's youth when it comes to broadening exposure to outdoor experiences? Yeah. You know what? I love this question because that is like, that is where the conservation and environmental movement was in 2008 and 2009. They were like, no screens. We're not doing social media. This is a conflict of interest. (laughs) (laughs) We want people outside. We don't want them looking at screens. That's true. I remember that. Right. And and as a result, a lot of those organizations did not have social media accounts. Could I remember the first time I did a talk and I talked about how I use social to invite people to uh, go out hiking with me and go to the farmer's market. And I showed the next slide of me actually doing that. There was an audible gasp in the room. <laughs> so like this idea that we could convert people from digital experiences into real life experiences was like foreign. But we know now that it can be helpful, right? Um, and I think that it, technology is not our foe, it is how we use technology that can be, um, can work with us or work against us. And I really, you know, I, I have screen-free days on purpose because I, I you know, we, we've got, and we've got to do that for our young people too, you mm-hmm. know, um, you know, give, we have to have some structure. It's not anything, anytime, you know, anywhere right? There's times to actually be present where you are, but there's also power in using this visual representation through digital to invite people into new experiences, to share information that experiences and opportunities even exist. Because back in the day, day, I used to have to go to the library, find a travel book, find a camping book, in order to get this information. Now we have ways of getting this information about what's available that ultimately broaden the potential for participation. And, you know, of course there's varying degrees of access to digital once you get to a park. I mean, there's, that's a whole other conversation about accessibility of internet, things like that in parks. But I think, you know, we can't, we can't dismiss the tool as a powerful one for invitation and activation. Um, and, and it really comes down to how are we going to decide to practice uh, mm-hmm. these tools uh, in our lives and in our families? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a great answer. Um, another question I have is, Rue, I loved your shout out about how nature is all around us. How do you feel about bringing folks out to nature versus bringing folks, bringing nature to folks? So an example of out to nature would be like taking folks out into a national park, And then bringing nature to folks, something more like doing urban land stewardship, things Mm -hmm. like that. I think it's both and, right? I mean, you just, you, I feel like there's no shortcut for building trust and relationships, 
you know, and you just have to find out who you're talking to and what they value, what's important to them. You know, people who live in stressed communities, you know, they're thinking about housing security. They're thinking about food. Um, so like, what are the inroads to talk about nature there? You know, um, you know, so oftentimes we want to impress our own value systems and experiences on other people that may not feel relevant. And so we have, we, there's, we just have to get to know what people care about um, and find those intersections, you know, and I love Graciela's example earlier about tacos and trails, like people want to eat, people love tacos, people want to <laughs> socialize, you know, and they want to do, in a, do so in a, in a less pressurized way. Um, and so we just, again, we just have to get to know like what people want because people, we forget this, but people do what they want to do. <laughs> they do what they want to do. They, they, people spend the money, they spend the time on the things they value. So the question becomes, how are you, how are you inspiring value uh, in outdoor experiences? And, and, and not your values, but what are the values of the community of interest? Mm -hmm. And working your, you know, responding to that. And this journey of outdoor Afro has been nothing but learning, adapting, learning, adapting. I have my ranch experience, right? But some, the next person may not have anything, anything remote um, to compare that to. Um, and so I have to meet people, you know, where their opportunities are. So that doesn't happen without getting to know people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Um, this book is filled with so much rich history that includes the connections Black people have to nature. They are personal narratives and finding such stories in other publications is pretty difficult. What would you say to folks wanting to bring more of these stories to light but don't have the network that you do? Do you have any recommendations on where to start? Yeah, I mean, I think starting in your own family is important um, because you're right. There, there isn't a huge body of writing uh, and kind of reference points, but there are several authors and people who are featured in outdoor Afros or, or in outdoor Afro community, but also in nature swagger who, who've been working at, uh, making these histories, uh, more visible. Carolyn Finney, um, has done a great job of it. Um, uh, you know, there are Leah Penniman. I mean, there, are, you have to be a researcher to find some of these stories. But again, a lot of these stories are hiding in plain sight in our own families. You know, one of the things that I've loved about this entire journey is just talking to relatives, talking about those special places that they grew up fishing in or going to stargaze in or where they always, you know, met with family and friends and or, or romantic connections. I mean, so, you know, we have a lot of rich story and history in our own families. And sometimes we don't value that story. We think it's no big deal or it's from the old times, you know? So I, I want to encourage everybody on this call next Thanksgiving or whenever your family chooses to get together in community, any holidays or gatherings, ask about your family's nature history and see what happens. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great recommendation. Thank you for that. Um, well, we are running out of time. Oh man. Um, I know, so <laughs> I have a ton of other questions that I, I can move to, um, but we, we are running out of time. So I wanted to give you an opportunity to let folks know how to get in touch with you or how to get in touch with the outdoor Afro, how to support. Um, anything else that you may want to add? Yeah, thank you so much. I'm just so thrilled to have this time with you all. And, you know, one of the things that's important for people to understand about Outdoor Afro and its approach, you know, we are a focused community, but we're not exclusive. We think of ourselves as the quilt in the blanket, right? And that blanket has a bunch of different patches um, that are all woven together. Uh, and so it's very important for our work to get done that we link arms mm -hmm. and, and really practice true diversity, which is multi-directional. Um, 
And we say, you know, you don't have to have an Afro to be a part of Outdoor Afro. If you support the mission of more people who look like me to get out and find their joy and their healing in the outdoors, if you're in support of that, we welcome you. And you can join our social media conversations. You can share your family stories with us. You can reach us at Outdoor Afro across all the platforms. Um, you can certainly, you know, feel free to send me a note um, at rue at ruemap.com. And I'm at ruemap if you want to find me on Instagram. And then I also, um, if you want to learn more about my hunting and fishing activities that, that are different than Outdoor Afro's area of focus, um, look up Black Heritage Hunt, um, where you'll see more stories and images of, you know, what helping myself and others, um, you know, um, learn to hunt and eat well uh, looks like. So I'm just really excited of keeping the conversation going and growing. And it's just an honor to be connected to you again, Graciela, as we likewise continue on our journey. Likewise. Yeah get to see you again hopefully we'll run into each other again soon i know you're in the bay area um but you know we'll, maybe we'll we'll meet in um vermont again um and so i also wanted to remind folks that if you haven't read the book if you'd like to get a copy we do have it in our store um and you can find it at store.forestwatch.org um, or you can just go to our website, forestwatch.org, and that will also lead you to our store. Um, follow us on social media. We, If you sign up for our newsletter, you can get emails letting you know when we'll have more webinars. We tend to do these a lot this year. We haven't had as many, but um, last year we had quite, quite a few. And the topics range everything from like science topics to cultural things or um, just local issues. And so I encourage folks to sign up for our email letter for e-news. E on our website and um, yeah, reach out to me if you have any questions, Graciela at lpfw.org. And thank you again, everyone for joining us. We will be putting this on our YouTube channel. Um, so if you are interested in, in listening to it again, or if there's something that you missed, um, feel free to look for it there. Thank you all. Thank you, Rue. Thank you for your support. Yep. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.